Hello everybody and welcome to this usual Friday video entitled the most undervalued growth stock. It's a video where I rank stock per my framework and per my method of analysis and I try to answer a question which is the cheapest stock not the question which is the best stock to buy because the best stock to buy and the cheapest stock are going to be two different things. You can have stocks that are expensive all the way up. You can have stocks that are expensive for 20 years. So it's just, just important to realize that. Really quickly, if you're new to the channel, I focus on growth stocks only in this channel. Hyper growth stock, more specifically. Um, I, I, my goal is to double monetary inflation, which I estimate at 15% a year, and therefore to double that, I need my stock to actually grow at 30% uh, to actually achieve 15% real returns and not nominal returns. It's a mistake people often make uh, between nominal and real returns. What matters is real returns, not nominal returns. Um, and in order to do that, I, I focus on different metrics uh, than I think a lot of the investing community. For example, um, my favorite metric is enterprise value over gross profit and variations of that metric. The reason why I use enterprise value is because I want to penalize companies that have a lot of debt, right? Because because debt really uh, messes things up. And if you use market cap and a company has a lot of debt, well, you're not taking that into account. And I use gross profit because gross profit is the most relevant metric metric for my style of investing. I don't invest in companies that are pre-revenue or that are not optimized for revenue yet. I invest for companies that are just optimized for, for, for gross profit and revenue. And the reason why I focus on, on revenue growth in, in general is because revenue doesn't lie. And revenue is a sign of product adoption, right? And so the whole idea of this purchase is try to identify stocks when their revenues begin to spike and they begin that S-curve and the goal is to try to get out when that S-curve stops. And these, these S-curves typically last you know, anywhere between 10 and 15 years. And so if you can stay a good 10 years within a stock and identify a growth curve early, get in early, you know, get, getting, you know, heavy to have kind of a big position, I would argue, in a, in a, in a stock that you know is going to get adopted, whose technology you know is going to get adopted, and you can ride that growth curve, that product adoption curve, you can ride it all of the way up. And the goal is to really try to get out of these stocks once they become valued on a price to earn earnings ratio. So that's why I don't focus on PE, because I don't believe any of the companies in this spreadsheet should be valued on PE. That would be unfair. And the, the metric that I uh, use to uh, pick a stock, right, or to say, is this stock expensive or is this stock not as expensive, is enterprise value over gross profit over revenue growth. And this is a spin on uh, the peg ratio of Peter Lynch, except I apply that to revenue growth and gross profit and not to earnings. Um, and and the, the reason why I do that <clears throat> is because, like I said, the companies today are mostly optimized for, for revenue growth and, and for gross profit. And, and earnings are so easy to manipulate. Uh, I, I would argue there's so much more manipulation of, of earnings uh, today than there used to be. And the question that this answers, the question that this EV over GP over revenue growth answers is, how cheap is that growth? Each percentage point of growth that I'm buying here, how cheap am I paying for it? And you want, obviously want it to be as low as possible. I consider anything under a 0.5 to be good, but uh, there are some stocks that are, that are way cheap. So you, you, you want strong growth, but you also don't want to pay too much for that strong growth. At least that's the principle of this spreadsheet. And um, the price of that growth how much you're paying up for, like, for, for that growth um, will will be whether you're overvalued or undervalued, will, will be the way I assess that. So let me go through the spreadsheet. And this spreadsheet, by the way, is organized by megatrends. We'll go for megatrends each time. But what are the six cheapest stocks right now in my cover edge universe? So I only include, include stocks who are under 0 0.2. So the absolute cheapest stock, again, is Hims now? Hims valuation hasn't changed much, but their growth rate has, has clearly, clearly changed. Uh, they, they've, they've upgraded their guidance quite a bit, uh, and, and because of that, now this stock is 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 the cheapest stock in the whole coverage universe, 
again. So congratulations, Hims. Then it's followed by, by a Love Sack, which is a maker of bean bags, which have, has been entirely forgotten by the, by, the, by the market. I've made a few videos on, on, on Love Sack. Kind of an outlier type of stock. Um, I, 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 it's, only, it's only a very, very, very tiny position for me. And, and of course, um, I'd be very careful because it's tiny, tiny stock. I'm much more confident in Hims, but still very cheap. The third one, which is a favorite of the channel too, is Stone Co. Stonye. Uh, I cover Stonye extensively on this channel um, I believe it's a great stock and that and that stock Stone Co is the cheapest of all the payment companies uh, followed by Indy Indy is kind of the same thing and um, I would be they just reported their earnings Indy semiconductors um, you know they're a very tiny tiny cap stock so you so you want to make sure you don't have too much too much of it if you if you were to own it um, then stem so stem actually um, had a really really good uh, Q1 really excellent uh, and uh, I am I am I am in stem now uh, I like stem I think STEM is a. I think I think there's room for two players in the battery storage space, and so given how cheap it is, I decided to make a move on STEM. And SoFi, SoFi is a, is the fifth, the sixth cheapest stock in the, in this spreadsheet right now at a 0 0.19. Uh, interestingly, is that SoFi there's been a decoupling between SoFi and NewBank, where NewBank is now expensive compared to SoFi. Very interestingly, um, moving on to the expensive stocks. And so this doesn't change, and I'm out of these two stocks. It's it's uh, it's uh, Shopify, and Shopify is right here at 1.4, and Nvidia, which I cannot understand how overvalued Nvidia is. I, I can't even begin to wrap my head around Nvidia. Um, you know, I, I wish I still owned it. I sold it a while back, probably too early. But uh, but you know, it's it's proof that you got to be careful. Most undervalued stock. Doesn't mean best stock. These are these are important distinctions here. Um, okay, so let me go through each mega trend in this spreadsheet. As you know, I focus on mega trend. So my favorite mega trend of them all is the energy revolution stock uh, mega trend. All of the stocks in the energy revolution. Um, energy underlies everything we do. Uh, the economy, the main input into the economy is energy. Uh, and therefore, uh, the energy is a, is, a, is a major, major mega trend, and it's, it's being revolutionized right now. It's just just like just like oil, you know, disrupted steam back at the turn of of the um, of the twenty uh, of the nineteen hundreds, right? Um, right now, electric is disrupting um, oil. Oil and gas is getting disrupted, and so I, my plays in this space are Tesla and Phase and STEM. Um, so Tesla, right now, we've had amazing news, right? Uh, uh, Twitter CEO was found. Stock is down two and a half percent. I'll never understand how the stock trades. It doesn't make much sense. But we had a really, really amazing news today about 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 Tesla stock, and uh, yeah, it it hasn't moved. It's 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 gone down. Uh, but the news is, you know, uh, Elon Musk is back to Tesla pretty soon. Um, but Tesla, nonetheless, is, is a little expensive despite this great news. Um, and Enphase is is a tad cheaper, and and the market got spooked on Enphase. I really didn't find any reason for them to get spooked, but we we kind of have a gift on the Enphase price compared to the Tesla uh, price right now. So I've been adding to Enphase a little more than to Tesla, and I've started a starter, tiny tiny position in STEM, but I've started a starter position in, in STEM. Uh, STEM is is a very very tiny company right now, but but they are a major installer and mega of mega packs, and they are they have a, a software that they service these uh, these mega packs. They service with them with their software. And so every time they install a giant mega pack for a utility or for a um, warehouse, they also sell a contract attached to them for 20 years. So this is a company that right now has mostly hardware revenue. This is why their gross margin is only 20%. But over time, it will be software revenue. And it's kind of the same story as te Tesla, if you think about it. Tesla still has a gross margin that is because of the hardware that it sells. But over time, with FSD, with all the things that it can sell, the gross margin will go up because you're going to have a lot of software. So it's about setting up a base and installing a base. Okay, let me move on to healthcare stocks. So uh, I used to own both uh, Teladoc and Hims, and now I only own Hims. I sold my Teladoc and I own Hims. Hims, um, I believe, is the most compelling play in the disruption of healthcare, in my view. Hims focuses on uh, subscriptions to, um, you know, 
pills, pharmacy uh, compounds, products that typically are recurring use, like air loss, for example. Air loss treatment, you have to apply it um, you know, for many, many, many years, and so that's a lot of recurring revenue. And they, 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 they have SaaS-like margins. I honestly don't understand uh, why they trade so cheap. If you look at how cheap they trade, first of all, they're the cheapest in my spreadsheet, but even if you look at, at, at EV over trailing 12 month gross profit, or even even if you were to calculate a price to sales, you know, they'd be at a, at a four price to sales. That's dirt cheap for a company that's estimated to grow at 56% with 80% gross margin and also a product that is arguably recession proof, very, very, very much recession proof. If you're getting treated for one of the minor issues that HIMSS addresses, the last thing you want to do is stop stop taking your treatment. Um, and they're growing extremely fast. And so I, I really like HIMSS. I think the leadership is, is highly inspirational. They're building something special. Um, and that company, what I love the most about HIMSS, and this is the main distinction between HIMSS and TDOC for me, is that HIMSS does not accept health insurance. And because HIMSS does not accept health insurance, it is agile, it can move extremely, extremely fast, and it can offer a service, um, you know, a brand that just innovates faster than the competition because they don't have to worry about reimbursement and gaining customers through partnerships with, with, with um, health insurance systems. And oftentimes they manage getting their products cheaper cheaper than copays so isn't that isn't that absolutely wonderful i think it is um let, let me move on to data warehouses data monitoring stocks that have to do with data big data is obviously a wonderful thing data feeds uh, feeds ai and feeds the modern enterprise and the modern enterprise runs on data and so all of these tools are essential out in this space um i actually still like palantir the best but um, right now, I wouldn't be, I would not be adding to any of these. You know, these got, these were so cheap, like three months, four months ago, that right now I wouldn't be interested in adding any of these because uh, there's been a valuation reset, right? And and their stock has gone up. But really, the next next four quarter revenue growth estimates that hasn't changed much. If anything, it has gone down for a lot of them. Uh, so, so I wouldn't be adding more to any of these right now. Um, I recently made a video on Palantir. I think Palantir did did a fine quarter. It did an okay qu quarter, but but in no way did the quarter that Palantir had. Um, two days ago, warranted the almost what twenty five percent rise in stock price. In no way, I don't. You know, I, I don't. I don't really see it. To me, to me, these stocks are trading on valuation resets right now, and thus I'm not adding to these stocks. Even though if I were to be pressed and pick one, I would pick. I would pick Palantir. If I were to be pressed, because I like Palantir for a military business, I think they have a unique positioning to become the the main software provider for 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 the military, for the main at least intelligence software provider. So I I like it a lot for that. Um, what about cyber security stocks? Well, cyber security stocks is kind of a, kind of the same story. Um, Net is obviously Cloudflare is obviously very very expensive, and I am staying away from Cloudflare at, at these at these prices. Although they don't reflect as much here, uh, they're actually pretty expensive compared to their peers. Um, I believe the, the most compelling in terms of price is Zscaler. But even then, if you compare Zscaler, um, you know the, the results of Zscaler haven't changed much. What has changed a lot is valuation, and and if you have a full position on Zscaler, or if you have a big enough position, I wouldn't be adding to Zscaler right now, even though it's it's the most compelling one. Um, I believe CrowdStrike and Zscaler, if you're going to invest in this space, they you'll see that they kind of work in, hand in hand, work together. They, they even have like combined offerings. So I think if you're going to be a cybersecurity play, if you're going to play cybersecurity, having both endpoint security with CrowdStrike and um, a zero trust security with Zscaler, I, I, I believe makes sense. They're com complementary um stocks I, be, I believe here um but anyways it's it's a uh, it's uh, it, it's expensive it's gotten it's gotten more expensive across the board here for this space now let me move on to e-commerce e-commerce adoption is still going on full steam you know across the world we're still only at about 30 percent adoption in the u.s 
Um, and so, for example, Shopify, Shopify to me, which focuses a bit heavily on the U.S. market, I find it way, way, way too expensive. And I've been out of the stock. It's 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 too expensive. So out of the two stocks that I follow in the e-commerce space, it's really a tie between C Limited and Mercado Libre. And I do prefer Mercado Libre right now just because C Limited has this overhang from their video gaming division and the main game that they had, which was called Free Fire, getting banned in India. There's still a major, major overhang uh, from from losing customers from their gaming division, and as a, as a result of that, the whole company is not growing at, growing as much. In other in other words, I, I would be much more interested in C Limited if I could, if I could just buy C Money and Shopee. If I could just buy e-commerce and the fintech and not touch the gaming division, I'd be all over it. But the problem is you can't dissociate. You gotta buy the free, and so you know. Anyway, free free fire, uh, open fire. I don't know what the name of that game is. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure I want to invest in that. So that's that's kind of a reason I still own the stock because I believe Shopee Shopee is a, is a leading player, especially in Indonesia. Indonesia is a big market, highly highly underrated. Uh, and Mercado Libre. So I I love Mercado Libre. Mercado Libre had a stellar, absolutely stellar Q1. If you follow the Q1, it was absolutely absolutely great. Um, they're growing across the board. Um, the only problematic part of Mercado Libre, uh, I would argue, could be that they operate in Argentina. But even if you look at their numbers in Argentina, they're way above inflation. Like in Argentina, I think they were growing 161% year over year in Argentina. And inflation in Argentina was 100%, roughly 100%. So that would mean they're still growing at um, 61% in Argentina if you're just for the crazy inflation. So so Mercado Libre, uh, I sleep very well at night with this stock. They are the, they are the leader in Brazil. They are becoming a leader across Latin America. They have very, very popular fintech. Um, it, it's, it seems to me like Latin America is, is, is going to be a um, high growth area that I really, really want to be invested in. And I, I love Mercado Libre. It's a, it's, it's a high quality company to me. Moving on to my payments. So payments right now, again, I'm very interested in Stone Cold. Stone Cold ran a little bit, actually. Uh, if you remember, if you've been following for a month, two months, three months, you remember Stone Cold was actually cheap. I mean, I'm, I'm being a snob here. It's like I'm nitpicking for 30% more. It's still extremely dirt cheap. But just to say that it's, it's gone it's gone back up quite a bit. So a lot of people are picking up on, on, on Stone Cold and Estonia and the value of this company. Um, Stone Cold is the only of the free payments stocks right here that hasn't been attacked by a short seller. And I think this is this is great, right? We don't have this overhang that we have on the local on Square. We are both under attack by, I think, relentless short sellers, and it's just disappointing. It's just disappointing. Like we have enough with macro and all the macro issues and the recession. If you gotta add another short seller and like you know double, like think about them doubling down and think about. You, you, you know, uh, lawsuits between the company being attacked and the short sellers. It just it just complicates the, the thesis and, and makes makes the thesis uh, a bit more cloudy, right? It, it it adds a lot of doubt. So so um, so anyway, not not too much of a concern. I have a little bit of the local, a little bit of Square Stone Co is the bigger position for me, and I think I think Stonier as the quote unquote Square of Brazil as well as the teeny tiny, a uh, small quick books of Brazil. I'm, I'm very compelled by the company Stonier. Let me move on to the chip makers. So whew, that's a lot to say about this one. So NVIDIA, NVIDIA is the leader in GPUs. Yes, um, GPUs are in very, very high need for um, for machine learning and for AI and for all of these transformers and the GPTs of the world. Very, very high need. Yes, data centers take about eight GPUs against only two CPUs. And so, yeah, CPUs are lower growth, etc. cetera. I, I'm, I'm familiar with the entire, entire narrative. I still believe, it's, and it's not a narrative. I mean, it's true that GPUs are more important. But but, uh, but I still believe that there's a little bit of hype going on here, uh, especially with, with NVIDIA. Uh, you see much fewer hype in AMD. But AMD got a little more expensive too this week when it announced, when it was announced that Microsoft was going to develop new machine learning chips with AMD. And so clearly a lot of clouds are trying to find an alternative solutions 
to the NVIDIA products that are so expensive. And so I believe AMD could have a major play also in the machine in the machine learning space. Um, because, you know, there's, only, there's always going to be a room for two players, one who's more a little more low cost or a little more scalable and one who is a little more, you know, high end and and the, the peak of the technology. So, so I doubt I doubt this is going to be a monopoly just for Nvidia. Uh, I think I think there will be more players. And and to me, if, if you gotta buy the chip makers, to me AMD is the is the way to go. In the in the I put it here, but I could have easily put in the in the uh, energy revolution uh, space there because they focus on OEM um, uh, manufacturers, of course, for automotives, and they focus on on ADAS system, on infotainment system, all these systems that go in the car. Um, they had decent earnings. The stock didn't move much despite their earnings. It's a, it's a teeny tiny stock, so you got to be very, very careful because they compete against giants. But the growth rates, nonetheless, are extremely high right now. The question is, are they going to be able to sustain that or are we going to see something a la Snowflake where Snowflake had, at some point, growth rates close to 100% and then they more than halved it? Is this what we're going to have for Indy? That's kind of a risk. And then you risk evaluation reset. Um, nonetheless, very interesting company. Moving on to my ad tech stocks. So I have two ad tech stocks that I follow, Cubematic and the Trade Desk. The Trade Desk is so expensive. It's an old position for me. You know, I don't, I don't. I, I, I don't want to pay the capital gains on it, so I keep it. But it's 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 expensive, and and that's that's kind of like one of the one of the things is like sometimes the stock can remain expensive for ten years, fifteen years. So again, I'm sleeping well at night, not not too worried, but still. Um, and and Pubmatic is another another small play that I have now. Pubmatic. One of the one of the areas of concern that I have a little bit of a, about Pubmatic is is well, of course, the, the growth has stalled. Although that's that's the nature of advertising right now. Very very few people are advertising since we're entering a recession. But one of the issues that I have with Pubmatic um, is the, this this whole news of GPTs and Google um, not 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 really you know forwarding people to websites where they can see ads that would be served by Pubmatic, but really pushing people to stay on the Google platforms and get their news on the Google platform. So so because of that, I, I sometimes wonder about Pubmatic. Nonetheless, the stock is dirt cheap uh, on a, on an enterprise value to gross profit. It's dirt cheap. It's, it's, it's an interesting company. Small cap. So again, when a, when, a, when a stock is so tiny, you need to make sure that you do proper allocation. Right? Don't put too much. Don't put a very, very tiny position. Try to do a market cap weighting for your own stocks, for your own portfolio. It's 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 wise to do that. I would argue. Um, you 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 know you don't want to you don't want to have a stock that's only a few hundred millions in market cap be your main stock because otherwise the the volatility. I mean, no investment advice. One does whatever one, but the volatility would be just insane. Um, because these stocks can be manipulated easily. Moving on to lifestyles and new stocks. So I've added a few stocks. Let me just go. Let, let me just go. Uh, that's where I put the new stocks that I've added. These 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 stocks. Uh, so uh, um, Digital Ocean and Axon. I've made a full analysis on these stocks, and I will re I will release them. Um, I will release them. As, as videos later later this week because I'm going on vacation so I'll release them later this week but uh, we had we had Celsius holdings love and things and I used to call those lifestyle and I might, I might call them other stocks we'll, we'll see how I call them um, so Lo love sack uh, they're making furniture they've been left they've been absolutely left for left for dead you know everybody says People are not going to buy furniture anymore because the real estate market is down, and that stock is dirt cheap. But again, very low market cap, so so be careful about that. But I, I've done a full analysis on Love Stack, dirt cheap. Celsius Holdings um, is is actually showing still outstanding growth. They've revised their growth up. The, the growth over the next four quarter here is estimated to be sixty seven, but you sixty seven percent. But you see, the, the problem with with Celsius Holdings. Is, is not only is it more expensive now, but but when I compare it, so for example, sixty-seven percent. What com what stock could I compare sixty-seven percent to? Well, I could compare that to, for example, a a uh, a Hims. Hims is fifty-six percent, uh, so not not too far off, right? Ten percent less than sixty-seven percent for Celsius. But then when I look at gross margin, the gross margin of a company like Hims is twice as high as the gross margin of a company uh, like Celsius. And I think Celsius has, has some idiosyncratic risk in the sense that Pepsi could buy it. 
because now they have this big partnership with Pepsi, which is propelling them forward and helping them with revenue growth. But if if Pepsi buys it, you know, then then that really doesn't fit too much in my in, in, in my style of investing because I can't hold it for ten years because somebody bought it. Anyways, I, I hope that makes sense. But but clearly, Celsius, an energy drink provider, new new energy drink, like a neo energy drink, has a lot of potential. Could be you know could be the next monster. As, as I like to say. Okay, then moving on to figs. I haven't covered figs yet. Figs have been disappointed. I've been disappointed about figs. The sales are not picking up. I've made a full analysis. They used to have much, much, much higher growth in 2020, 2021, even 2022, and, and now it's 13%. So I'm probably going to exit my figs, although it's a tiny position, so I'm cozy. I don't have to be rushed. Um, Axon and Digital Ocean have two stocks that I covered. I've added them on the channel. So Digital o Ocean, um, it's a fine stock. It's it's growing a little slow at twenty three percent for me, but it's 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 a fine stock. They have a fine positioning. The only um, issue that I have with Digital Ocean is that they are competing against big tech, and they, they are they are a cloud provider, right? They are they are an AWS service. Um, easier to use that AWS for small businesses, essentially, is what they are, and they are building their own infrastructure, um, and uh, they have a lot of capex because of that, because it's quite expensive to to build all of this. But they are competing against giant players in the field, which is one 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 small area of concern that I have. And then Axon, I, I really don't have any, I really don't have any issues with with Axon. I think Axon is a, is a fine stock. Um, the, the, the stock has been grow, growing steadily for a while, but now the growth has stalled to twenty two percent, and that means that this is a stock that's probably going to grow slower than my thirty percent threshold. Um, and now you may say, "Oh, yeah, but you're um, you're okay with Palantir growing at twenty percent." Well, it's true, but I when I bought Palantir, Palantir was growing much faster than twenty percent. Uh, they had guided thirty percent. And you know now I'm like I, I'm a stock I'm I'm down I'm not gonna sell it I'm gonna keep it uh, I I would argue that um, in the in the security defense play which which perhaps wrongly I, I wrong I, I group them together um, having one one play in this sector is enough and if I'm gonna have one play in this this kind of defense security sector it's gonna be Palantir one play one play is enough um, there's a few competitors for Axon I, I'm releasing a video this week on Axon and you will see some of the competitors that I've identified for Axon very interesting stuff but any anyways both Digital Ocean and Axon to me are fine companies. They're they're uh, they're quality companies in my view. Let me move on to neo banks. So we have Nubank and SoFi. So Nubank is a is a leading play, leading player in Latin America. They're you know number one app in many countries, heavily used, and uh, the stock ran up quite a bit for 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 this, this neo bank and provider of financial services recently. So uh, I'm back to SoFi now, uh, and and it used to be they were the same price. There used to be a time where Nubank, per my metric, was a tiny, tiny cheaper, and, and now SoFi is a, a cheaper one. So, so I think SoFi is interesting, especially if we get this catalyst on student loans. Um, I was reading an article today about student loans saying that one of, one of the big push to uh, to actually forgive student loans and and, and, and sorry to, to not forgive student loans not forgive student loans so 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 for the student loans to not forgive and to just resume payments one of the big push for that is that that would free up 400 billion dollars for the government that would be freed up to be able to, uh, uh, to 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 spend right, and and you know there's the, there's the debt ceiling negotiations right now, and so clearly if there was no student loan cancellation, the government would find four hundred billion dollars that now can be used to extend the length of the government or the length of a debt ceiling debate. The debt ceiling will have to be raised no matter what, but but it it seems it seems I mean there's rumors that that if we don't forgive student loans. Four hundred billion dollars comes back that can be spent to, you know, pay for the running expenses of the government. So that could be a positive development for SoFi, although nobody would have thought this would be the turn of events that that the, the student loans would not be cancelled because of a debt ceiling. I, I don't know. We'll see. That's probably that, that may be the case. That may not be the case. We, we'll see. But that, that's what I was reading this morning. I thought it was interesting analysis. And obviously, the reason why we care about student loans for SoFi is not because student loans are a big business for SoFi. If you follow SoFi, 
you know, they've moved on from student loans. You know, it's not that big of a business. But the market still believes SoFi is mostly a student loans player. That's what the market still believes. And so once once that overhang goes away, I believe the stock can shoot up. It's all about, you know, thinking about what the market may want. And lastly, platforms. Uh, so out of the three platforms are Airbnb, Etsy, and, and Fiverr. Um, I don't own Etsy. I don't, I don't own Fiverr, although I'm interested in these two companies. But, you know, right, right now. Uh, I still need to look more into it, and I still need to have confirmation that the growth will will resume at least two. Um, but Airbnb, you know, Airbnb is doing just fine. They provided somewhat of a weak guidance, and and Wall Street, you know, through through a fuss, Wall Street was all upset. But I I read it and I thought it was fine. So so you know, it's uh, it's yeah, twenty percent revenue growth. They're still you know they're still they're still the leader uh, in 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 their space. They, they still they still have. So much, um, you know, access to so many rooms. If you look at the number of rooms that Airbnb can provide, it's it's just just staggering and mind-boggling. And it's a wonderful business model because they don't have to pay the capital to set up their infrastructure. It's kind of a polar opposite of, say, a digital a digital ocean who has to pay all of that capital up front. Airbnb has to pay no capital up front. That's the power of platforms. So, so anyways, and it is the, it is um it's not the cheapest, but but if you if you um if you um, you know, Fiverr. I think there's there's some issues with ChatGPT. So so at least it's the cheapest one that I that I like the most in various Airbnbs. Is I guess the way I will phrase it. And so hopefully this is helpful. Feel free to stop the video. Look at my metrics. You know, agree, disagree. This is this is literally just telling me me telling you what I use. It's uh it's uh you know it's there's nothing definitive. This is not investment advice, of course. This is just entertainment. Um, I hope you're entertained. Thank you for watching. I appreciate your likes and your subscribe and uh, have a wonderful day.